Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Merkel from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview film professionals to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by Philip Moses, VFX supervisor at Temperamental VFX, and Raul Bolognini, uh, president and CEO of Temperamental VFX. Now, Temperamental's work includes The Grudge, Booksmart, and most recently, Blonde on Netflix. Welcome to the show, guys. Hey, nice, hey. To, uh, nice to be on. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Now, uh, Raul, I have a question for you because I was going through Temperamental's uh, webpage yeah. and on it, uh, it talks about embracing the efficiencies of remote workflows uh, and a global team. And I was wondering um, if you could elaborate like on that. How did you, uh, would, how have you found efficiencies in, in global uh, workflows? Well, I can't give away the secret sauce too much, but uh... <laughs> No, I mean, look, we this this whole company was set up really because um, um, at the time I was working for a visual effects studio in Los Angeles, and um, you know the reality of tax credits uh, that the studios uh, need to chase around the around the world uh, was becoming more and more of, of, of a reality, and so uh, it became that much harder to do business. So in my mind, I sort of always had this idea of uh, having a remote based visual effects company that would give us the freedom to literally go anywhere in the globe to be able to do visual effects and to capitalize on tax credits, but also to um, really reach out to areas where um, we found uh, have a lot of talented artists that haven't actually been able to make it, you know, because of the sort of the North American and the European um, industries being so strong, you know, so it's, 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 it's been a blessing for us really in the sense that we've been able to, we've been able to stretch our talent pool and um, it just gives us it gives us a lot more flexibility in getting things done. It gives us the abil- the ability to sort of work almost a twenty four hour machine uh, within the two, the different time zones as well. And um, and that's really the DNA of the company. So um, that, that those are the efficiencies that uh, that we found and we uh, and we still work by. It's interesting. And like, how do you you know? Because like when I talk to some people that the, like a lot of VFX companies would farm out to other companies. Uh, in this case, you're sort of not farming out, but working with teams in other locations. So how do you guys keep everything on the same page and ensure consistency across your visuals? I become a 24 hour working machine and it's, uh, it's taking its toll on my age, but um, no, look, we have, uh, we have a, we have a, we have a well-organized system. Um, we use the industry standard, which is ShotGrid, which connects everybody. You know, it's uh, it's a tool whereby um, vendors and artists can submit their shots to, and Philip, as a supervisor, can review them and make comments, and so can I. And um, it's really it's really a mainframe hub for keeping all of the information together, um, so that when we wake up in Los Angeles and people have been working through the night in different time zones. Um, playlists are already there for us to look at and, uh, and make comments on. And that's, that really is the glue that kind of keeps the communication together, honestly. So yeah, if I can add something really quick, Gordon, I mean, I think all of these efficiencies that Raul has talked about are just some of them. Um, and your question speaks to sort of like that natural instinct was like a potential downside, but it's actually a potential upside as well. You know, if you have an in-house team where you've invested, you've hired 5, 10, 20, 200 artists, whatever, however big your company is, you know, those skill sets are sort of, I don't want to say they're static because everybody can grow and, and, and whatever. Um, but the real benefit and one of the efficiencies on the creative front is that you're now able um, to cast teams for specific sequences um, that are best suited for it. So if you have a team that's fantastic with particle work, um, all, like reality-based particle work, and another team that's really great on like fantasy type stuff, you know, you're able to sort of like be selective and to cast that work out to different places, um, um, to different teams. And, and so the net gain is that within whatever work that that team is working on, you know, they're able to be consistent and, and, and achieve the level of visuals that you want. And you're sometimes able to get there 
easier than if you had to walk somebody through it who just sort of understood technically what needed to happen, but didn't really have a, a great creative vision for it. I'm going to interrupt this interview for one second. We want to thank Pixelview, one of our sponsors. They're a streaming solution for filmmakers. Pixelview lets you stream your work to remote clients for easy collaboration, and it works with both on-set teams and post-production teams. With built-in video chat, you can discuss and make changes in real time and stream directly from your editing software. Or you can use the hardware encoder to stream from DaVinci Resolve or the camera on set. See the promo code and the link in the video description below. Well, I'm, I'm wondering how did you guys get involved with Blonde? Um, well, Blonde, uh, we actually, you know, we were working with Annapurna on a different, uh, on a different film. And um, the gentleman that's in charge of post at Annapurna asked me if I'd be interested in reading the script for this sort of um, micro budget um, Marilyn Monroe movie. And um and I said, sure. So, um, you know, we, I, I got in probably about a year and a half prior to filming, met with Andrew Dominique over at uh, Plan B and was then introduced to one of the producers, Brad Pitt, um, and um, fast came to the realization that we were already on the movie, even though we hadn't really, we hadn't really spoken much about it. Andrew seems to be one of those guys that he has a gut instinct for things. And I think he took the recommendation that came from somebody that he knew very well and luckily for us uh, ran with it and it's been a huge success for us and um and thank goodness andrew's got good gut feeling because you know we um we introduced philip along the way as well and uh philip and andrew just had such great synergy between the two of them you know from the creative point of view right from day one and um it really was one of those projects where the right people came together uh to do what we had to do budgetarily challenged we'll get into that a little bit more and I'm sure you'll dive into the creative with Philip more but that's essentially how it came it fell into our laps is that it was a recommendation and um and a director that sort of um very much thinks outside of the box and looks beyond and um and and saw that in both Philip and I and here we are today so you know you mentioned that it, it well you mentioned that it's budgetarily challenged so like in how do you tackle that to make sure you're still giving the best, uh, you know, most amazing work that you can, uh, but but also not burning out your employees? Well, that's, yeah. I mean, look, that's part of what we do as a company. And that's part of why this company was set up so that we could offset all of the tasks that tend to drain the coffers away. Mm -hmm. So that we could protect the creative shots and protect Philip's team locally um and um and, and and give it the resources that it needed you know and sometimes that isn't often the case um every visual effects company comes into a project trying to be as responsible as possible to ensuring that the money is well spent but there's just there's a lot of back-end stuff that people don't uh, foresee um storylines stories change as they're being developed in editorial and that has its own set of uh, additional shots and so within the structure that we have in this company, we're able to sort of maneuver that around the world in areas where we won't be paying so much of an overhead so that it doesn't drain away the money that's really needed for the creative stuff. So I'd like to know, Philip, how do you, like, what were the, uh, what were some of the challenging shots that you were, you were given or challenging tasks, I guess you were given for Blonde? Yeah, I think, um, well, first, it's just sort of the, the the number one challenge is sort of like wrapping your head around um, Andrew's, you know, vision. You know, he had been ruminating on this film for a decade. Uh, when we walk into the production office for the first meeting, like the walls are covered with images of Marilyn Monroe uh, and, and scrawled on and circled. And, you know, every department had studied them because every frame of the film is basically a recreation of of some iconic image uh, from her, her very public life. So understanding both just his vision and his process. And I think that his process is where um, uh, some of the more simple things could become challenging. Um, things where we would normally shoot like a multi-pass, uh, like some of these theater comps, for example, where, where they're watching footage up on the screen. Uh, normally you would maybe throw something up there to give you some interactive light 
and uh, you would manipulate that interactive lighting on the crowd uh, in post. Um, but Andrew wanted very specifically that the footage that's on the screen to be present and live. Problem is, is we shot some of those shots that were projected on day four of the schedule and we're shooting in the theater on day 10. And there's some fairly extensive visual effects work that needs to be projected within like six days or something. So we had to, in the middle of production, the middle of principal photography, uh, get artists working around the clock very quickly to get footage back so that it could be projected so that the lighting wouldn't be a uh, an augmented thing, but the lighting would be the lighting. You know, and he, he's very, very much about his cameras and the stocks and the, and the you know, just the, the, the different looks that were emulated throughout the film. And, and he wanted to capture that in camera as much as possible. And, uh, and, and it sort of was like, it's kind of interesting, but where we were having to sort of reconstruct these things um, outside the normal visual effects process, but in a way that sort of, matched his aesthetic and the way he wanted to shoot if that makes sense it it does it's it's interesting because as you said it's like there's these it, it's marilyn monroe she's iconic <laughs> like right. you know like i'm sure like my daughter's five i'm sure she's somewhere seen a marilyn monroe reference <laughs> so right. right so when you're creating these vfx where is there or working with your team like is there room to adjust things or i guess like bend the reality a bit to something that would fit the story more or do you have to you know like the dress has to be exactly the same it can't be shorter or longer or the hair has to be exactly the same like where where does it where yeah. do you have freedom i guess i could say i would say that like the the good news is a majority of those conversations uh uh is something that our department didn't have to weigh through you know like the the costume department and, and hair and makeup and all of those things they were under so much pressure um to going back to what raul said to sort of shoot this very big film on a minimal budget and and just scheduling and wigs and all of that stuff you know does sometimes tends to put some work over a visual effects side to, to do some cleanup work here and there but as far as the overall aesthetic and matching it was very, the, the movie itself is surreal in its um, depictions of reality versus sort of like an interpretive reality. Uh, so, so we did wade in between those, you know, we're sometimes we're in full technicolor, sometimes we're black and white, sometimes we're, you know, you know, four, three or Academy and other times we're cinemascope. And so, so we're jumping, like the visual language of the film is changing so often um that each almost every shot is an opportunity to sort of explore a little bit you know um i don't know if that helps or, or answers the question um but it, all of it was a process and it was very very intimately directed by andrew you know it was his vision so our job was to support more than lead in that regard um but uh I think, yeah uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's sort of also, as Philip's saying, you know, it's sort of specific to what was actually going on within the film, you know, like where um, there were moments where she sort of, you know, was having flashbacks or, or well, they weren't flashbacks, they were, you know, she, she thought she could see her father, you know, or certainly towards the end of the film. And um, those moments are where you get to kind of like have the most creative play, because I think Andrew had an idea in his head about how he wanted it to be, but also he kind of didn't have it it wasn't as specific until he saw it so mm -hmm. you, know, you kind of we took that and we were able to play with it a lot more there's a lot more freedom to kind of like go into a more expansive creative world as opposed to well no the wallpaper has to be like this because that's how it was at the Beverly Hilton you know so or whatever but so in terms of just replicating that period stuff so um that was the other nice thing as well is is that Andrew had um, some other people that he'd sort of worked with across the globe. And so we reached out to them and we said, hey, will you be a part of this? And they were, and um, it added to the value of, uh, of what Philip and the team were sort of putting together. So now when you were working on this, how did you get on the same page as the director, like, uh, you know, and make sure that you guys had the same aesthetic? Well, we definitely talked about it beforehand, you know, uh, obviously before we were shooting. 
uh, talking about, you know, ultimately what, not just what he wants to see, but what he wants to feel when he's looking at the shot. Um, why the, the scene is important to, to the story at that, at that point. Um, and, um, and then it was like, you know, the logistics part of it, working with production to make sure that we're able to shoot the things that we need to shoot. And then when we're in post, it's just, that's where his very exact and um, very specific vision would come into play. I, I sometimes use this as an example. There's a scene where we're driving, um, little Norma Jean is driving with her mother up the mountain and there's fire everywhere and all that stuff, which was its own technical challenge because there's you know, we're shooting in Los Angeles basin or in the, in the hills of Los Angeles. And we couldn't even have a single flame bar. So it's a lot of LED lights and smoke and all that stuff. And adding in that fire uh, was, he was very particular about the size and where and this and that. But then even the embers as they're driving by, the background embers are the things that are flying in the foreground. Things that like normally in a, in a show or in a film, you would sort of you would put them in and you would dial them up by certain percentages or whatever. Um, Amber was, uh, Andrew was, was <laughs> sometimes hand choosing the path of some of these embers, you know, and, and directing them to a very, very specific degree, which is great because, he, you know, it just, he, it just showed how much he cared about like every single detail. But it was definitely one of those things where um, things that you would think of as more of a procedural type thing were were very art directed as well. And that's how it was with everything. It's like once you start showing it to them, then he starts, you know, to Raul's point. Now he's starting to understand what it is that he's looking at. He he sort of like narrows in on on all of those details. But, uh, you know, I think overall the scope of the project wasn't um <clears throat> wasn't massive it was just a massive undertaking and bringing it into where we were with the schedule and budget and and andrew's unique very specific vision so is there a particular scene or vfx part of uh, the the film that you guys are both really proud of uh in in terms of your work i think we both talk about the the hollywood scene where yeah. they're driving yeah. down down the road in in uh, the convertible I'm, I'm very proud of that I know Raul is as well and I wish that there was more of that in the film um, but that one was sort of a you know that was the sort of deal where even up until maybe a week before we shot we were still looking for the right location to shoot that and we ended up shooting it in downtown uh, San Pedro in Long Beach and there was a bunch of, we set up a bunch of lights and we set up a, a big white LED marquee sort of thing where, where ultimately the theater marquee would be. And then it's just film it and then the rest is up to post to, to painstakingly recreate this entire two city blocks leading up to the theater, um, which was a, you know, a composite of, of real buildings at the time, as well as um, fabrications and stuff like that, just to sort of fit fit what would be at that intersection. And uh, I think the end result is super effective using the lighting that was given to us by on set. Chase and his team tried to light two city blocks in like less than a <laughs> just a few hours. Uh, and you know the end result I think is is pretty magical, and it, I think it stands up to any kind of full CG set extension. Yeah. You know, so, so I think that that, you know, that one, uh, among others, but I would say I would say that one would kind of thumb, I'm, something I'm most proud of. I think the moment we dropped Adrian Brody into uh, into New York as well was pretty, uh, was, was yeah. pretty cool. Um, just just by the sheer nature of Andrew sort of begging and pleading 20th century to give him some stock footage, you know, of that of that era and uh, getting that scanned and digitized and uh, and then dropping adrian into it which again i think philip you shot on a street corner in san pedro didn't you where we just put up a green screen and a couple of fans and um and in he yeah. went <laughs> yeah um yeah but, um anytime you can give a movie scope by doing big visual effects like that i think it's always really rewarding um it really opens up the film and makes it a lot more exciting as well. Like Philip said, I, I wish we had more of those shots, but 
thankfully we got that and we got um hollywood hills on fire we you know we got that shot and um and and a few other bits and pieces even the moments where we sort of dive into some of marilyn's films you know with mm. replacements on on um on stand-in actors to make Anna feel like she was actually in the movie and the split screens on the train and some like it hot. I mean, those are all those moments where um, we got a decent amount of them, but um, just the iconic nature of her and everything that she'd been in as far as film wise, it would have been nice to have done a bit more of it, but you know. Well, okay. So I have one last question for you guys. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or show to watch? Hmm. Oh, I think that, yeah. Go ahead, Philip. I'll go for no, no. I want to hear I yours first say, before I no, before I, I say. <laughs> being a Brit, the absolute guilty pleasure for me on a Saturday is making sure that I watch man, match of the day, so I can catch up with my football team or my soccer team, as you guys like to say. So that's my that's my first guilty pleasure. But the uh, the other one for me, and it's uh, you know, it's it, it, it's always got to be it's always got to be a, a Martin Scorsese film, film or a Sidney Lumet film. You know, I think those are my I watch those films over and over and over again. And if I was to say there was a standout between the two of them, it would be Serpico and um, and probably Goodfellas. You know, so that's me. <laughs> Uh, I do not have as refined of an answer as Scorsese films. I'm just <laughs> going to be completely honest and uh, say that, you know, when I get a chance to sit down and watch something, I have five kids and it's, you know, it's, it's a rare point of connection for us. And so I find myself watching a lot of just British baking shows and just just weird things that my family's into. My daughter has introduced me to a show uh, called Midnight Diner, which is all in Japanese, which is just this super fun framework for a story, which I would love to see sort of like revisited, you know, but uh, it's just this guy that runs a diner from like midnight till six in the morning. And he has one thing on the menu and people come in and he'll either make what the thing on the menu or whatever he happens to be cooking. So you get all these little narrative stories sitting around the food. And for me, it's just so other. It's like it, the, the production quality is so not there that I'm able to turn off all of that critical thinking and to just like hang out with my daughter and watch something fun. So for me, that's, that's my guilty pleasure is to kind of get back into just like a moment of escapism, which I'm finding harder and harder to do when I go to the Cineplex. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for letting yeah. me interview you today. Yeah, well, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Yeah, great to meet you. And that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.